most of the berberine uh, that is described in the medical literature is the berberine chloride or the berberine hydrochloride. And all the studies I'll be talking about today administered berberine hydrochloride. If you collect all of the current publications on berberine, you'll find that there are 65 clinical trials, human clinical trials, using berberine hydrochloride as a single agent. There are quite a few reviews, meta-analyses. Uh, there are about 1,200 animal studies that have been published to date, and there's a wealth of in vitro data that informs some of the mechanistic information um, that we'll talk about later in this lecture. So let's just break down the clinical trials and what they've focused on. Insulin and glucose homeostasis are the main focus of berberine research. Uh, there are 18 different human clinical trials using berberine as a single oral agent to support insulin and glucose uh, homeostasis and promote healthy glucose responses. Overwhelmingly, the results of these trials have been positive. Uh, another interesting area of berberine research focuses on the gastrointestinal uh, tract and the microbiota. And berberine is known to modify the microbiota in the GI tract, and that is one of the leading hypotheses as far as how berberine might be executing its beneficial cardiovascular and metabolic effects. The third area of focus is cardiovascular health and lipid profiles, and we'll talk about some of that research in more detail. Some clinical trials have addressed liver health. Uh, quite a few um, have uh, kind of gone pretty deep into the pharmacokinetic issues with berberine. Uh, berberine bioavailability is very low, so there are some studies exploring ways to get around that. Um, and then finally, drug interactions are an important area uh, because berberine is an unusual compound. It's an alkaloid. It has a nitrogen uh, atom in it. We don't really come across these types of molecules in the, the dietary supplement space very often. Um, and it does have the capability to directly interact with P450 enzymes that metabolize various medications. And I'll talk about the drug interactions uh, when we get to the end. So let's go into some of the evidence-based interactions with the focus on cardiometabolic indications that are shown here. So berberine has been studied primarily to support glucose responses and promoting a healthy glucose response is one of the main reasons why you would want to consider using berberine in practice. Another indication is lipid profile. And then thirdly, vascular health. So these three areas pretty much sum up uh, metabolic health and cardiometabolic health, which affects a very large percentage of the U.S. population. So berberine has a variety of mechanisms that converge on supporting healthy glucose responses. And one of those mechanisms is supporting the expression of the actual insulin receptor itself. So this was a study that found that berberine supports the expression of the insulin receptor in a variety of different human cell lines in a dose response um, manner. So this is one of, the, um, one of the many lines of evidence that shows that berberine actually supports the function of the receptor, the expression and function of the receptor. And then when they gave berberine to humans in this study, uh, they found that the percentage of blood cells that expressed insulin receptors increased with supplementation. So in essence, berberine is helping that insulin receptor to present itself at the membrane and be there when it's needed so that it can help the body better respond to the glucose that's floating around in the bloodstream. So this may explain why the evidence overwhelmingly supports the, uh, the fact that berberine supports this healthy glucose response. And here you can see in the open circles, fasting blood glucose, and in the, the dark circles, postprandial blood glucose, this was a small study of 36 subjects. They received 500 milligrams of berberine three times daily for six months. And the study found just within one week, there was a significant uh, favorable effect on the uh, glucose response. So um, the effect can be appreciated within a couple of weeks after a supplement is started. You don't necessarily have to wait many weeks or months to wait, you know, to see a benefit. This was a single arm study of 12 women. This actually used a form of berberine that's better absorbed than other forms of berberine. And on the left, the HOMA index is a way of measuring how well insulin is working. The insulin that's already in your body, how well is it actually working? And they found that after 60 days of supplementation with this phytosome, uh, which we'll talk about later, 
there was a significant benefit as far as how insulin was actually working. And then on the right, there was also an improvement in the amount of insulin that was being uh, produced. So maintaining healthy insulin levels um, would be another uh, potential benefit of berberine based on this small study. So most of you probably took some uh, courses in, in medical school or in your allied health education about how insulin and glucose uh, actually work, you know, how insulin supports the disposal of glucose and how that is relevant um, to managing cardiometabolic health in practice. So let's just take a minute to review that. So a beta cell is one of the cells in the pancreas that releases insulin. So the beta cell releases insulin and then the insulin binds to its receptor and this occurs throughout the body, especially in muscle, muscle cells, fat cells. Uh, it, it triggers the translocation of glucose transporters, those channels to the membrane, and that allows glucose to enter the cell. So this is basically how glucose gets into cells. It needs insulin, needs insulin to be released. It also needs insulin to bind to its receptor and enlist a signaling transduction pathway that causes these glucose transporters to get to the membrane and allow glu glu glucose to enter the cell. So there are a variety of things that can go wrong here and a poor diet uh, will typically trigger a reduction in insulin sensitivity. So the actual receptor won't work as well once it's bound. Uh, berberine tends to work in both of these different areas including the release of insulin from the beta cell. So we'll talk about this, uh, and then we'll also touch on the second mechanism uh, by which berberine supports the actual uptake of glucose uh, by supporting the insulin receptor function. So in mice, if you take out a certain potassium channel, which is located in the pancreas, if you genetically knock it out, the mice no longer respond to berberine. Uh, their glucose levels don't change if you give them berberine. So it just doesn't work as well. So this finding led to this hypothesis that this, uh, this interesting um, compound is actually supporting the release of insulin from the pancreas through this potassium channel. So how might that work? This is a close up of the beta cell in the pancreas and insulin release is dependent on the membrane depolarizing. And that membrane depolarization is regulated by this potassium channel. So researchers found that berberine actually binds to this potassium channel and causes it to close. And when it closes, the potassium current stops and that allows the membrane to depolarize and that encourages the release of insulin. So this is one of the the newer mechanisms of action that have appeared uh, in the preclinical literature, suggesting that berberine supports the release of insulin through this potassium channel by direct interaction with it. The Western diet is uh, one of the biggest threats to what you're looking at right here. This delicate system where insulin is bound uh, to its receptor and that receptor activates glucose transporters. So, High calorie diets, high fat and sugar intake, being overweight will reduce the function of the insulin receptor. Um, and also uh, any kind of oxidative stress or immune activation like inflammation will reduce the ability of that receptor to engage glucose uptake. So interestingly, berberine attacks both of these and berberine supports the expression of the insulin receptor as we talked about a moment ago. It also supports the expression of insulin receptor substrate one, which the receptor needs to activate these transporters and get them to the membrane. It also negatively regulates NF-kappa B, which orchestrates immune activation um, in the presence of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this um, also involves a, uh, an oxidative stress response that is enhanced through berberine through NRF2, which supports antioxidant defenses. So that mitigates oxidative stress that would also negatively regulate this entire process. So we've talked about glucose, let's talk about lipids. So berberine supplementation generally doesn't affect HDL cholesterol. It generally doesn't affect triglycerides. Its main effect is LDL. So 
This was a study of 80 individuals receiving a dose of 500 milligrams per brain twice daily for three months, and there was a significant benefit for LDL cholesterol. So the dosage, even at uh, 500 milligrams twice a day, um, can also be efficacious in a three, over a three-month period. So if you are using berberine for lipid profile, you want to use a minimum of 1,000 milligrams per day. Ideally, 500 milligrams twice a day would be your minimum dose, and then allow three months to reevaluate. Um, but they did this, and they found significant support for healthy lipid profile compared to placebo. And then when they stopped the supplements, the benefits were reversed. So this is something you always have to think about uh, when you're using any kind of um, compound, whether it's a medication or a supplement, what will happen if you stop taking it? Um, this actually lends a support to the data set. It strengthens the result. Uh, but, you know, if you stop taking it, the lipid profile might, uh, you know, kind of go back to where it was. Um, so this, this may be a long-term uh, supplement if you want to help maintain a healthy lipid profile. So they started the supplement again and the effect was replicated. So really strong data set, small study, um, but um, very convincing results. So in order for LDL to be disposed properly uh, in the body, it requires the LDL receptor. So the LDL receptor binds LDL and it's internalized and it goes inside of the cell, it gets broken down. Uh, this is how the liver gets rid of LDL. There is one uh, small problem with this. There's a protein called PCSK9, and that actually sits around and waits to bind to the LDL receptor, and it destroys it. So once it's destroyed, it can't go back up and be recycled and work again and again. And this reduces the amount of the LDL receptor that is available on the membrane to internalize LDL particles. There is new evidence that suggests that berberine modulates this process. It directly modulates PCSK9 and may thereby support the stability and abundance of LDL receptors at the membrane. And that is one of the key steps of proper disposal of LDL. It remains to be established whether you can get enough berberine into the body for it to do this. Um, because the bioavailability of berberine um, can be as low as 1% or less, um, you might not be able to achieve this with doses commonly used. Um, so there are probably other mechanisms at play if you're using the typical dose used in clinical trials. So this is basically a uh, hypothesis, but it is an interesting one. Um, there is a, a great proof of principle out there that PCSK9 inhibitors uh, favorably affect uh, lipid profiles. So by blocking PCSK9, you can actually enhance the number of LDL receptors that are at the membrane. If you're interested in this infographic, I will point to a resource at the end that you could check it out with a short article that goes into it. Another area of uh, research on berberine involves the vasculature. And there are two components of vascular health that are worth mentioning here. First, the vascular smooth muscle cells. This is, this is a compartment of the vasculature that most people might not be aware of, or you know, it's not talked about as often as it should because these smooth muscles regulate the thickness of the artery. And you want these muscle cells to maintain them their own you know, normal shape and size, because once they become bigger, um, then the vascular thickness increases. So this is something you want to avoid. Anything that helps keep these smooth muscle cells in, uh, with, you know, in, in, in the proper um, shape and size is something that's desirable. And of course, many of you are probably familiar with endothelial health as a, a pillar of cardiovascular health. And berberine supports both of these. So in the vascular smooth muscle, Berberine helps to attenuate the actions of growth factors that would normally cause these muscle cells to grow. Uh, it also helps to arrest the cell cycle of the muscle cells so that they are less likely to grow. Uh, so that is an interesting area of berberine uh, in the vasculature. So one other area that is quite interesting is supporting nitric oxide synthesis in the actual endothelium. And just to refresh your memory, nitric oxide is made from arginine, which is an amino acid requires an enzyme to convert it to nitric oxide, and berberine may support that as well. And that may explain why in this study, 
researchers found that berberine, when given at a dose of 12, 1,200 milligrams per day for one month, significantly supported flow-mediated flow mediated vas vasodilation. And this is a measurement of endothelial function. Largely, it's nitric oxide dependent. And they found that after the one month of supplementation, individuals who took berberine had significantly higher flow-mediated dilation than individuals in the control group. Some of the most compelling analysis of, of berberine and its efficacy comes from meta-analyses. This is a big meta-analysis of 27 RCTs involving over 2,500 patients, and it confirmed the safety and efficacy of berberine in supporting glucose homeostasis and maintaining lipid profiles. It was also more effective when combined with lifestyle interventions than when given as a supplement uh, without any, any additional interventions. So as always, you want to combine berberine with a more comprehensive approach for best results. And that would include exercise, um, healthy diet, and so forth. Je uh, berberine was also safe and well tolerated according to this analysis. So the dose limiting toxicities of berberine are mostly gastrointestinal in nature, um, but they are, they are not very common. Uh, the, low dose, uh, the lower doses around 1000 milligrams per day are unlikely to cause that. You get into that when you, when you approach, mainly when you approach 1500 to 2000 milligrams per day. So it's a dose dependent, very transient, mild effect um, that, you know, if you have someone who's, who has some GI issues already, you want to be cautious with berberine and just start with a low dose. So we've gone through the three, uh, top three evidence-based uh, indications for berberine. Clinical trials have administered 500 to 2,000 milligrams per day for four to 12 weeks. And the safe and effective and well-tolerated dose range is 900 to 1,500 milligrams per day. So that's a good uh, range to just keep in mind. When you buy a supplement, that's the dose that you're looking for.